Dr. Phil Campbell of the Northern Lights United Church. Will members please rise? Good morning. It's an honor for me to be with you again today. The poet Mary Oliver asks, what is it you plan to do with your one wild and precious life? In this leap year, when today the calendar grants us a 29th February day, I invite you to share this time with me in the spirit of Mary Oliver's question and as, as I pray to observe it in a manner appropriate for your own practice. Source of breath and giver of life, I am grateful for yet another day. May the specialness of this day not go unnoticed by those gathered in this chamber, may this day, this one wild, precious leap day, produce fresh insight, creative possibilities, and imaginative responses to the end that those charged with the governance of our great state will discover 
new ways to address the many challenges we face. Amen. Amen. Representative Keto, would you please lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance? Representative Wilson. Mr. Speaker, I ask unanimous consent that the prayer be spread across the journal. Hearing no objection, the prayer is spread across the journal. This time we'll take a brief at ease awaiting the arrival of our brethren from down the hall. Will the House please come back to order? In accordance with the provisions of Uniform Rule 51, I turn the gavel over to the President of the Senate, the Honorable Kevin Meyer. Will the joint session please come to order for the purpose of the annual address by U.S. Senator Dan Sullivan? Mr. Majority Leader. Mr. President, I move and ask unanimous consent that the roll call of the Senate be waived and that all members be shown present. Okay, hey, seeing no objection, the roll call of the Senate will be waived and all members will be shown as present. Ms. Majority Leader. Mr. President, I move and ask unanimous consent that the roll call of the House be waived and that all members be shown as present. Okay, seeing no objection, the roll call of the House will be waived and all members will be shown as present. So at this time, I'd like to ask Senator Machiki and Representative Newman, uh, if they would please escort Senator Dan Sullivan to the joint session. And while they're doing that, we will stand at ease. Okay, will the joint session please come back to order? Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for that nice round of applause. President Meyer, Speaker Chenault, 
members of the House and Senate of the great state of Alaska, thank you for allowing me another opportunity to come and speak to you today. And I want to first and foremost start by thanking all of you, everybody here, for the great service you and your staffs do for our great state. It's great, great to be back home. Much has happened since I addressed you last. Some of us, particularly me, have a little more gray in my hair, a little more uh, wrinkles around the eyes, a little more squeaky joints after a run. Uh, we've certainly, all of us, logged in a lot more miles in the state, uh, throughout the country, and even in parts of the world. And a year later, we're a little bit wiser, hopefully. Hopefully we're a little stronger and more generous and kinder, because if experience doesn't do that for you, there's no point in even having it. And some of us have had milestones in our lives. Some, like my wife Julie and me, uh, have sent one of our children off into the world. As a matter of fact, we just got back from our first parents' weekend from her college, our daughter Megan's college in California. She's a freshman. And it's nothing like visiting a college campus that can make you feel both the passage of time, but also a strong sense of optimism. And we all know it, but I think it's important to say we are certainly raising amazing kids in our great state, amazing kids in our great country. And I know many of you, like me, got into elected office because of our kids, because of our future. In the past year, unfortunately, we've also lost people, family, parents, colleagues, who have left an indelible mark on all of us. I didn't know him as well as many of you did in this room, but I worked very closely with Max Grunberg when I was a state's attorney general and DNR commissioner. I don't have to tell this body this. He was a good man, a Vietnam veteran, had a service, servant's heart, a moral compass, always set to true north. His seat might be empty, but his spirit certainly still fills this room. So what else has changed? The price of oil, for one. That wasn't even a joke. Um, <laughs> and I know I don't have to remind you of that. And I don't need to remind you that you are wrestling with some of the biggest issues to confront the state in decades that are going to have a big impact on the future of our state. And I, for one, want to thank you for the hard work that all of you are doing here. So how about a round of applause for you? And I say that because in DC, I believe we should be taking more cues from what legislators in states like ours are doing. Because of course you know we have our own fiscal crisis in Washington. Right now approaching $20 trillion national debt. But we're not doing nearly enough to address that. Last December, I voted against the 2,200-page, $1.8 trillion omnibus spending bill that was dropped on Congress with three days to vet. And I said, that is not how we should be conducting our business, and it's certainly not worthy of the American people. And when I mentioned why I was voting against it, I gave a shout out to this body and said, yes, through an open and transparent and, yes, contentious process, the state of Alaska is addressing its very significant challenges. And we in the federal government should be doing the same. And we're not, in my view. So again, I want to thank you for the example that you're providing. And I'm confident that whatever will be crafted here will reflect the will of Alaska. It might not always be expressed gently, 
might be a little loud, certainly a little messy, maybe even a little angry, but democracy is never intended to be genteel and add the independent spirit of Alaskans to the mix, and well, you have a pretty lively brew. And I know that's what's happening here. So speaking of a lively brew, I thought it might be a good time to quickly introduce some of my staff that's here with me today. Joe Balash is here, my chief of staff, who cut his teeth in politics and policy in this building. Many of you know Joe. Mike Anderson, my press secretary, continues to tower over all of us, keeping us in line. Amanda Coyne is here. Many are probably happy that she's still here with me and not reporting on you. <laughs> Connie McKenzie's here. She's doing a great job representing us in Juneau. And she's not staff. Much more important than that, my, my wife, Julie, the love of my life, the best thing that ever happened to me, no doubt, is also here. So we all know, you know better than anybody, that the, face, the state is facing challenging times. But Alaska has often faced challenges. And what I've been doing to prepare for my remarks today was to look back over the last decades, really, at other senators who have addressed this body in a joint session. I think there's wisdom to be gained through looking through the past on what some of our previous leaders have said, particularly during challenging times. And what is clear when you look at their messages is that we've always come through the challenging times that the state has had stronger, better. And working together, I know we'll do it again. In 1988, in what many refer to as the crash in our state, Senator Ted Stevens spoke to this joint session of the legislature, and he said, quote, our federal government does not have the ability to reverse the decline in world oil prices, nor does it have the resources to restore the losses experienced by our state's economy. But, Senator Stevens noted, the federal government does have the ability to help the state in many other ways. It has the ability and indeed the responsibility to invest in infrastructure, to help make sure Alaska is getting the full value for its fisheries, to help us develop our resources, and to help the country recognize how important Alaska is in terms of national security and our military. And of course, Uncle Ted was right. During those years, Alaska enjoyed the benefits of having one of the strongest federal delegations of any state in the country, with Ted Stevens, with Frank Murkowski, with Don Young. Today, Lisa Murkowski, Don Young, and I are working towards restoring that strength. And already, as a united federal delegation, we can point to some significant successes that we've had that were highlighted by Senator Stevens almost 30 years ago. So let me talk about a few of these. First, infrastructure. We know it is crucial to our economic development. It always has been, whether it's the Alcan, whether it's the Trans-Alaska Pipeline, roads, mines, bridges. When you look at Alaska, we have engineering marvels in terms of infrastructure. Last year, we were able to pass the first long-term highway bill in well over a decade. And that was one of these issues where Senator Murkowski, Don Young, and I worked very closely. First, to defend a federal formula that provides significant, significant infrastructure dollars to our state. That is often under attack. So in this highway bill, we'll be getting $2.6 billion of transportation funds to the state of Alaska in the next five years. This will provide certainty for infrastructure investments, 
but also critically will unlock opportunities for the private sector, which is what infrastructure does in our state. Next, let me talk about another industry that's critical. I like to use the phrase back in DC that Alaska is the superpower of seafood. 60%, almost 60% of all fish, crabs harvested in the United States, 60% come from Alaska's waters. That contributes to almost 80,000 jobs directly and indirectly in our state and has roughly a value of $6 billion, which is huge for a state of our size. So we have been working and made significant progress this past year to increase demand for that product, that great Alaska product, produced by what are really fantastic small businessmen and women who take risks, who pass on businesses from generation to generation, who produce a great product, and we're going to continue to make sure we have a strong industry there and strong, healthy coastal communities that are supportive of our Alaska fishing industry. An important part of the work of this body that so many of you have been focused on for years, and I've learned a lot from so many of you, is taking care of the most vulnerable in society. And when I started as Alaska's Attorney General in 2009, many here, but in particular, I want to do a shout out to Senators Liesl McGuire and Anna McKinnon, helped me focus on the issue of sexual assault and domestic violence, which as we all know is a scourge of Alaska. And I've taken what I learned from many of you to Washington and the passion on this issue because it's a problem in the country. So I had the opportunity in the past year to have two bills that my colleagues in the Senate passed that will bring more attention, more resources to the fight against sexual abuse, domestic violence, and human trafficking, not only in Alaska, but throughout the country. And I want to talk about another issue when you talk about the most vulnerable that has really struck both our state and the country in almost like a tidal wave. And that's the issue of opioid addiction that so many of our communities are seeing. And so many of you know when you meet with constituents and you hear from them and you see these issues that it can have a huge impact on you. And I'm seeing that both when people come to visit. I had a visit with eight women from Juneau who came to talk to me about this. And it was probably the most impactful meeting I've had as a U.S. Senator in the past year. And then getting to the communities and seeing what's happening to so many Alaskans, regardless of race, regardless of class. So a bill that I co-sponsored to help combat this problem, we're going to see being take, taken up on the Senate floor in the next couple of weeks. And I think it's going to be an important start for the federal government to start focusing on an issue that in many ways is ravaging many states throughout the country. In terms of veterans, we proudly boast and you all know, more veterans per capita than any other state in the country. And trust me, as a member of the Veterans Affairs Committee and the Armed Services Committee, probably every member of the U.S. Senate is sick and tired of me quoting that statistic. <laughs> but I do, because I'm proud of it. And I know we have a number here. Can I ask all the veterans to stand up? We're in the room. How about a round of applause for their service? And we are holding the VA's feet to the fire about getting the health care to our veterans that they have earned and they have deserved. And one of the things that had happened with the passage two years ago, the Choice Act, was that it came to Alaska and it essentially did not work here at all. So we're going to continue to focus on that. And I also want to mention we are keeping an eye on and learning 
again, from the states in terms of what you're doing for our veterans. And again, I think Alaska leads the country on that in terms of policies. I want to do, uh, I'm, uh, I wanted to mention that I'm supportive of a new initiative that's going to be coming out of this body. My good friend Bob Heron will be proposing an initiative that our men and women in uniform who suffer what's called post-traumatic stress disorder have the diagnosis change to post-traumatic stress injury. A diagnosis implies you can heal because you can heal. And I want to thank Bob Heron for that kind of leadership on these issues. Now, as for resource development, we know that it continues to be the economic driver of our state. Alaska's North Slope remains a world-class basin with huge untapped resources. And we are beginning to see, and I know you're starting to hear about it, some major projects moving forward, which could produce hundreds of thousands of barrels of oil a day, mostly on state land. This is exciting news. But the federal government, of course, has a history of putting the brakes on these kind of projects. In 1968, when the Secretary of Interior, Stuart Udall, proposed regulations that would have basically shut down plaster mining in Alaska, the wise former territorial governor of the state and then U.S. Senator Ernest Greening put it this way, quote, Alaska is different. Laws and regulations made from the four, lower 48 state, states are not necessarily suitable to Alaska. In Alaska, we can prevent pollution by wise state action and federal cooperation without limiting desirable development. Indeed, as you all know, Alaska is different. We know how to responsibly develop our resources and we know that one-size-fits-all regulations from Washington don't work. But to be honest, we're not going to see much, if any, recognition of that in the final year of the Obama administration. No big home runs on Anwar. No big home runs on other elements that are important to our state. As a matter of fact, we are likely going to be playing defense. Unfortunately, this administration, as you all know, is focused too much on locking up and controlling more of our lands, on delaying projects. They're even opposing a bill of mine that I introduced a few months ago that would have made good on a promise to give allotments of land to Vietnam era Alaska Native veterans who missed the chance to apply for their Native allotment because they were serving their country. This is a bill I put forward, testified in front of Senator Murkowski's here, uh, committee on it. The Obama administration came out and said they are against it because, quote, it's unfair. Unfair. I'll tell you what's unfair. Penalizing Alaska Natives who served their country during one of our most contentious wars when many Americans were actively avoiding service to their country and they're not going to let them have that chance, that's unfair, and we're going to keep fighting it. So in this final year, we are unfortunately expecting more lockups from this administration, and we're all working together, and it is truly all of us working together, the state and the feds, need to re we need to remain vigilant. We've already done that, killing a number of regulations that the administration has put out that have been solely focused on Alaska. We have been using our oversight powers to continue to hold administration officials, cabinet secretaries, EPA administrators accountable. And that's going to be more important than ever during the final year of the Obama administration. So looking back on many of the speeches made to this body, nearly all of them do what I just did there. A list of accomplishments, which I think is appropriate. After all, we're politicians. But I think sometimes it's also very important 
to broaden the aperture beyond just what's going on in Alaska, to broaden the aperture to look at what's going on in the country and indeed what's going on in the world and how our state fits into that. So let me start by saying there's good news in that regard and there's bad news in that regard. I'll start with the bad news. Testifying in front of the Senate Armed Services Committee last year, former Secretary of State Henry Kissinger had this to say about what's going on in the world. Quote, the United States has not faced a more diverse and complex array of crises since any time since the end of the Second World War. The world is clearly becoming a more dangerous place. And there's a lot of reasons for this, but one that's become clear to me and many others is that America has been steadily withdrawing from our traditional leadership role in many places in the world. Just a few weeks ago, I had the opportunity to go with a bipartisan group of senators to what's called the Munich Security Conference. This is a big annual security conference, world leaders, defense ministers, foreign ministers, and the theme in speeches, but more importantly in private meetings with these leaders was where is the United States? We met with the prime minister of a very important ally of ours, and when asked at the end how we can help her country, she stated to us, there's one thing you can do to help my country, but all the countries. You need to lead again. The United States needs to lead again. You're not doing it, and we're seeing the impact on global security. And as the U.S. withdraws, we've left a leadership vacuum in the world, and others are filling it, whether it's countries like China or Iran or Russia or North Korea or terrorist groups like ISIS. And they're filling it with a danger, a dangerous intensity across swaths of the Middle East, in the South China Sea, on the Korean Peninsula, in Ukraine, and closer to home in the Arctic. So that's the bad news. Now what's the good news? The good news is that Alaska is increasingly being viewed as a place with the strategic location, with the assets, with the personnel, with the communities that are so supportive of our military, that we are being viewed as playing a critical role in our nation's defense. This is good, of course, for the United States, but it's also good for Alaska. And the timing is right for us. As all of you know, the military has played a critical role throughout the history of our state in building Alaska. And now, during these challenging times that we have here, we're fighting to ensure that the military is coming back to help us sustain our way of life and continue to protect our country. I like to talk about what we have in terms of what I call a triad of military power capability in Alaska that is really, truly second to any other state, second to none. And that is being increasingly recognized and importantly, increasingly bolstered. First, we are the cornerstone of America's missile defense. Second, we're becoming the hub of America's air combat power, not only in the Asia Pacific, but around the world. And third, because of our location and our strategic airlift capabilities, we are becoming recognized as an expeditionary platform that can rapidly move all the well-trained troops in our state to any hot spot in the world. So let me provide a little more detail on each of these. In the area of missile defense, our country faces growing threats from intercontinental ballistic missiles, from North Korea, from Iran, and in the next few years, the Department of Defense is going to be making significant investments, building on and constructing projects involving missile defense throughout the state of Alaska. Within the next few years, we're going to have 44 ground-based missile interceptors at our base at Fort Greeley. 
and there's going to be hundreds of millions of dollars going into construction in terms of advanced radar at Clear Air Force Base in addition to that. This is important for Alaska, this is important for jobs, and importantly, it's important for the defense of our nation. Second, in terms of combat air power, we are becoming that hub for the Asia Pacific. Just look what's coming our way due to the advocacy of so many of you here in your communities. F-16 aggressors, F-22s that are already here, the F-35s that are likely coming very s within the next couple years to Eielson, the E-3Cs, our C-17s, C-130s, KC-135s, all aircraft supported by active duty military pilots and airmen, Alaska National Guard pilots and airmen who are literally, literally second to none in their professionalism. And then there's our ground troops. Alaska has two of the best trained active duty brigade combat teams in the U.S. Army. For those in the interior, you know the First Striker Brigade, the Arctic Wolves. And of course, at J Bear, we have the 4th Brigade Combat Team of the 25th Infantry Division, known as the 425. And that's in addition to our outstanding National Guard units, our special operators who are, do outstanding work in terms of pararescue missions, and of course, thousands of Coast Guard members who perform heroic missions around the state and overseas on a daily basis. And we need more of them. So I was pleased to see that the governor's budget contained funding for an initiative to expand the Guard and the Alaska Defense Force in rural Alaska. And I want to thank Lyman Hoffman, who has been championing that issue for years. So my number one priority in the past year as your U.S. Senator has been to advocate for defense and mil military policies that enhance the capability of Alaska's military Alaska's triad of military power for our nation, including increased defense spending to bolster our nation's defenses, but also to provide for the well-being of our state and our economy here. So you see, uh, we have a PowerPoint presentation we left you at your desk, and it's just one of the many ways, whether it's secretaries of defense or generals or other senators, that we are getting in front of everybody everybody on these important issues. And where President Obama and his administration have done a good job on these issues, I am literally the first guy to go out and applaud what they're doing. Let me give you an example where they're doing that on missile defense. The President's budget, his missile defense director, they were all here recently. That is a strong, strong statement of policy that I am very supportive of. But when they have strayed in supporting such national defense priorities in Alaska, I've used my seat on the Senate Armed Services Committee to lay out why they need a course correction and to lay out why they're wrong on policy. Let me give you two examples of where that's happened. First is Russia has been dramatically building up its forces in the Arctic, four new brigade combat teams, 11 new airfields, two huge military exercises just last year, 40 icebreakers with 12 more coming. We put forward an Arctic strategy that was 14 pages, half of which were pictures. Climate change was mentioned six times or five times, and Russia was noted in a footnote. It wasn't a serious strategy. It wasn't a serious document. So what we were able to do in the defense authorization bill was put forward an entire section on the Arctic, an entire section on the need for a serious strategy, an entire section that required what's called an operations plan for this part of the world, one of the most strategic areas of the world. We know that, and now the Secretary of Defense and his team know it. And second, and many of you are aware of this, last year, despite what's going on in the Arctic, the Department of Defense decided to essentially get rid of one of the brigade combat teams that I talked about, the 425. 
as the Russians were building up, as we saw challenges in North Korea and other places. The only airborne brigade combat team in the entire U.S. military, in the entire Asia Pacific, I mean. And this makes no strategic sense. So what we've been doing in the last year is spending literally hundreds, if not thousands, of hours making the case that this does not make strategic sense for the country, and it does not make strategic sense for our state. And trust me, if the Obama administration does move forward with its initial plan to get rid of this brigade combat team based in J Bear, they're going to literally do this practically over my dead body. <laughs> but hopefully you're seeing that tide on this issue is starting to turn when General Mark Milley, who's now the Chief of Staff of the Army, was up for confirmation, I asked him to put a hold on this decision, to review this decision, and to actually come up to Alaska and see for himself what this brigade combat team was all about for the strategic forces of the United States. And he and I had an opportunity to visit the 425 just three weeks ago at Jay Bear. And just last week, you may have seen that he recommended that the U.S. Army should hold off on plans to cut this unit from Alaska. Why? Because of the changed security environment throughout the, country, throughout the world, and again, because of our strategic location here in Alaska. So there's more to be done on this, more commitments to be made, but I am optimistic that this critical unit to the country and this critical unit in Alaska is going to remain intact in Alaska. <laughs> now, I know all of you have a deep respect for our troops and their families. And I will tell you, one of the best parts of my job is to have the opportunity, and I know many of you do this, to get out with these troops to get out with our Coast Guardsmen, to get out with the 425 and the First Striker Brigade to go see them train. I had the opportunity to do that last year with the First Stri Striker Brigade down at the National Training Center. And just about two weeks ago, I had the opportunity to watch the 425 execute a nighttime training joint forcible entry operation at Fort Polk, Louisiana. Almost a thousand of Alaska's paratroopers dropping out of the sky in the middle of the night. You want to see a powerful instrument of American military might based here in Alaska. That was an incredible sight. And for me, it's been a long time since I jumped out of an airplane in full gear. Not sure I even want to do that again anymore. But as you watch those paratroopers of ours jump into the night sky, the pride that every one of us would have as Alaskans, as Americans, was very, very apparent that night. So let me conclude my remarks by talking about a video that I recently saw, which reminded me of the old adage attributed to Mark, Tra Mark Twain that history doesn't repeat itself, but it rhymes. <laughs> the video I saw featured three U.S. senators talking about Alaska. The one sitting in the middle moderated the discussion. The one on the left talked about how important Alaska and the Arctic was to Alaska's national security and how we need to beef up our military defenses in our great state. The one on the right talked about how important it was to develop Alaska's natural resources for the country. And if you close your eyes and listen, you might think they were all members of the current Senate majority in the U.S. Senate, but they weren't. The year was 1960, and the senators were Scoop Jackson of Washington State, John F. Kennedy of Massachusetts, and our own Senator Bob Bartlett in the middle, moderating the discussion, proudly wearing a bow tie. Senator Kennedy, who kicked off his presidential campaign here, 
spoke of the urgent need to develop a blueprint for resource development in Alaska. He said, quote, it's going to require vis vigorous action by all of us here in D.C. and by the people of the state of Alaska. Senator Jackson talked about Alaska's role in terms of missile deployments, in terms of our air power, and how important it was to keep airmen in Alaska. Senator Bartlett, of course, looked delighted. He loved our state with all its promise, with all his heart. Today, history isn't repeating itself, but it is rhyming. Our pro priorities today are, in many ways, the priorities of yesterday. And the solutions they spoke about then, and the importance of these policies they spoke about then, are in many ways some of the solu solutions to the challenges that we're facing today. In his legislative address to this body in 19. 66, Senator Bartlett said that Alaska's history is, quote, magnificent and stirring. Each of us here has a part in making that history. That is one of the elements that makes an association with Alaska so exciting and so thrilling. That's what he said in his address to the legislature trying to do the math right now, but I think that was 50 years ago, right? 60? And it is thrilling, and it is exciting, even though we have big challenges. He talked about the future, how he and the Alaska State Legislature would work together to make this a magical place, magical, for all of us and our kids. 1966, they did that. We live in a glorious state, still so full of freedom and opportunity and Alaska-sized dreams. You all have big decisions to make. We have a lot of work to do together to continue to make this a magical place for us and for our kids. And in Washington, we're going to continue to do everything in our power to help you do that. God bless all of you. God bless the great state of Alaska. Thank you. Thank you. Senator Sullivan, do you, uh, do you have time for questions? Yes, sir, Mr. President. Okay, great. Um, Senator Stoltz. It's my old desk here. It's a, thank you, Mr. <laughs> Senate President. Welcome, Senator Sullivan. Thank you, Senator so the, I'm glad you talked on one of the, briefly on one of the topics. It's about the last thing I think I'd be, thought I'd be asking you a question about a year ago, and that's yeah. on the issue of addiction. I, too, have had a lot of those very shocking and uncomfortable um, conversations with Alaskans uh, who have, uh, their family has been vis visited by addiction. First it's an attack on the, on the addict and then it seeps to the family and then the community and it's a scourge that has, has no boundaries. It's uh, whether it's income, whether it's race or gender or neighborhood and, and uh, you ta t touched briefly on that in uh, a bill that you're, uh, the, um, the Comprehensive Addiction Recovery Act, what tools might that give Alaskans? And I think this is going to be a multi-tiered yeah. throughout our state and uh, across our borders. It's, uh, and I appreciate that you brought it up and look forward to your uh, elaboration. No, exactly. Well, thank you. Thanks for the question. And uh, look, uh, Senator Stoltz, I, I kind of had the same like moment, right, where, like I said, constituents coming in. I will tell you again, this meeting I had with these courageous women from Juneau who are struggling I, I mean, I, I get kind of choked up just now, what they're trying to deal with. And then you, you, know, you go to different communities and you, you see these things. And as you guys know, you know sometimes you, you think you have an idea on what's important in the state and, and then, wow, something new, something dramatic, something you know, in many ways horrible. So what I told my staff after a number of these meetings is look we gotta we gotta help we gotta dig into this we gotta understand it we have to 
So this CARE bill that we're going to be uh, moving forward on, it's bipartisan. I think we're going to take it up maybe next week, as early as next week. It, it'll, it's going to essentially do what I think the federal government's role on something this dramatic can be to help with resources, to help with education, to help closer monitoring of pre prescription drug use, um, to help with regard to more treatment programs and, you know, detox centers. So, but the key is, and you just mentioned it, is this can't be the feds coming in and saying, hey, do this, do that. This has to be literally everybody working together. States, communities, the feds. And one thing I tried to do once we started really getting involved with this, I asked to see the Secretary of Health and Human Services. So the woman who's in charge of kind of all these issues. It was interesting. I know her. She thought when I wanted to go see her with my team, I was going to talk about Obamacare because she's in charge of Obamacare. And I kind of said, look, I'm not here to talk about Obamacare because we're not really on agreement on anything about Obamacare. What I want to do is talk to you about this problem. And we need your resources and your expertise. And I invited her to come to Alaska or part of her team to come up here. And essentially what we're going to be planning on doing, and we'll make an announcement. We have the time and we're going to coordinate with all of you. But to bring up the experts on the federal side, like her and her team, and try to bring together state legislators, community leaders to to kind of say what is what can work, exchange ideas, because as you know, this problem is not going to be solved in a year, and it's not going to be solved by one entity, like the feds or the state or local communities. It's got to be a huge effort with everybody pulling on the same oar. And so I've invited her to come up. I got an email just recently. She's hopefully either going to come up herself or send her deputy to help kind of spur action and ideas and brainstorming um, throughout the state. So I appreciate the question. And I know that there are many of you, probably most of you, who are more experts on this issue than I am. But we're trying, and we know it's important. And I'll tell you this, it's happening everywhere. I mean, not just in Alaska. It's happening in New Hampshire. It's happening in Maine. It's happening in Pennsylvania. I mean, it is everywhere and it's a big problem and the Senate's going to be taking up a bill to address it in the next couple of weeks. Thanks for the question. Okay, thank you, Senator. Uh, Representative Heron. Thank you, Senator. Mr. President. Uh, Senator, thank you for your words. And when you took us on this tour of Alaska history, and all the good people that you talked about that have got us where we're at. I feel really good about that it's your turn, you got the hands on the wheel, and I'm very confident that we're in good hands. Thank you. Thank you. But, <laughs> uh oh. About <laughs> <laughs> what? No, I'm kidding. Is, I would conclude on the, on, the, on the military part of this is thank you for fighting for our military men and women and the strategic. Uh, importance of our state and our country. Um, sir, I don't know if you're flattered, but uh, here in a couple minutes there's going to be a protest outside, and you're the target. Oh. And what I in, do? <laughs> it's in that their, their protest is going to be in the, in the name of climate change. They want to shut Alaska down. But we need to develop our resources for our families. Sure, we know what negative effects of climate change are. But Senator, how can we afford to make those investments? How can we adapt to climate change if our resources are locked up? Senator, in conclusion, we need to grow our economy. You know this. We need to develop our resources in a safe way. But how can we do this if we're locked up like a snow globe? Well, look. Um Thank you very much for those comments. And by the way, I want to thank all, you know, when I, when I was talking about making the case on the strategic value um, of Alaska, there's, and that's one of the reasons we provided this PowerPoint. So many of you are doing that, not only here, 
but you're doing that with regard to what's going on in the Arctic Council, with regard to testimony. I'm looking at some of the members of this body who've been testifying in front of Congress on these issues. And so I want to thank you guys, because in many ways, the most powerful advocates on the strategic location of Alaska are coming right from this body, and the most powerful advocates on resource development and having a strong economy are coming right from this body. And it's bipartisan. If you noted what I tried to do in, the, in my remarks today is quote from Senate senators who were Republican, senators who were Democrats. And you know, it's interesting to watch, to listen to John F. Kennedy talk about resource development in Alaska and how important that was to the country and how important that was to Alaska. So look, as you mentioned, you know, we're seeing the impacts of climate change, but somehow the notion that developing energy sources, and I'm a full believer in all of the above energy, hydro, wind, and yes, hydrocarbons. I mean, the president talks about a huge drop in the amount of greenhouse gases that the United States has produced over the last several years. Okay, it's true. But you know what he doesn't say? It's because of the revolution in natural gas development. That's why that's happened. So if we're producing natural gas or other sources of energy that's going to empower our people, empower communities where we have the highest cost of energy in the country, we got to be able to do all of it. And I think that's what you want me to advocate for in Washington. And I know that's what all of you are advocating for. And I don't see it as a partisan issue in this body. It's a very bipartisan issue. So thank you for your comments. Thank you, Senator Sullivan. Uh, we do want to conclude by 12, so this may be our last one. Sen Senator Denleby. Thank you, thank you, Mr. President. Welcome home, Senator. Just a quick Thanks. question. Um, with the recent passing of uh, Supreme Court Justice Scalia, there's been much said, much discussed about how this process to replace him is going to unfold. Just like to hear your thoughts on sure. uh, how you think this, this, this process should, should unfold. Well, look, I think, um, you know, there's this initial reaction, hey, the president shouldn't put for forward anybody in terms of a replacement. Well, my view is a little bit different. The president clearly has the authority to put forward a replacement. Just look at his powers in Article II of the Constitution. But also look at the powers of the Senate in Article II, Section 2 of the Constitution. And our powers are also very unequivocally stated, which is we have the power to provide advice and consent or withhold it. And the Senate Judiciary Committee, I'm not on the committee, but they voted and the chairman of that committee agreed uh, not to have a hearing on if the president puts someone forward. And, I, and so that's not going to happen. Now, there's been a lot of complaints about this. Let me just make a statement that I think is pretty factual. It's a counterfactual, though. You know, if the shoe were on the other foot, imagine we were at the end of a eight-year term of a Republican president, say John McCain, if he was elected in 2000, and we had a Senate majority of Democrats right now. I'm pretty sure the same thing would be happening right now. As a matter of fact, Joe Biden has already essentially said that previously when he was a senator. Chuck Schumer did. Senator Reid did. So to me, it's not a huge surprise, and particularly now that this vacancy has come up literally in the throes of a presidential election, I think one of the most important things we can do is let the American people and let the Alaskan people decide. Because this election is now becoming very clear in November. Yes, it's going to be about who controls the Senate. Yes, it's going to be about who controls the White House. But it's also going to be about the control of the US Supreme Court, which is why this is such an important election. My own personal uh, view on kind of how I will evaluate as a senator, even though I'm not on the Judiciary Committee, a nominee, because there will be a nominee eventually, is I'm going to be looking for someone who, in many ways, was focused on the issues that Justice Scalia was. He was an ardent defender of the separation of powers, an ardent defender of the separation of powers and a full defender of federalism, what he called dual sovereignty. 
the power of the states is listed in the Constitution, just like the power of the federal government is. And I had the honor of meeting him as a young uh, law student, something that I you know, will never forget. Some of you I've told the story to, it's pretty amazing. You talk about con law, my con law final with the chief justice of the, or one, or the, one of the justices of the Supreme Court on the streets uh, right outside of Georgetown. But I also, and this is really important for us, had the honor to have watched what ended up being his final oral argument. And that was the Sturgeon case. That was our case. That was it. That was the last time that Justice Scalia, and you should have seen him, for those of you who were there, he was active. And trust me, it was pretty clear which way he was going on that. And he was going our way. And to me, that's really important to make sure whoever replaces him, particularly on these critical issues that relate to our future, separation of powers, federalism, that we have a justice who is as strong on those issues as Justice Scalia was. So that's what I'm going to be looking for. Senator Sullivan, thank you very much for your time and for addressing the uh, joint legislature. Um, I'm sure you'll be around throughout the day. So, yes, sir. okay, great. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you.